Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to another episode of the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host. I'm Adam, your co-host. Real quick, we wanted to give you an update because we had previously previously talked about how Microsoft rolled back the change on blocking internet macros by default within Office for all customers. And we did say that it was going to be back, and it is. Obviously, Adam and I didn't realize it'd be back so soon, but it is. And so on July 20th, Microsoft updated their blog article that talked about it initially back in February, and they wrote this. We're resuming the rollout of this change in current channel. Based on our review of customer feedback, we've made updates to both our end user and our IT admin documentation to make clearer what options you have for different scenarios. For example, what to do if you have files on SharePoint or files on a network share. And they have some documentation there for you. And so that's it. That's the news. We just wanted to say it's back on anyone who has enabled or disabled it by policy within your organization. It's not affected by this change. It's really for those who haven't done anything. It is now back on by default. They're rolling it out. And so if you haven't done it by policy, you will start to see that in your organization. And we touched on this briefly when we covered this in our uh, podcast, which will be at least two weeks ago by the time you hear this. Uh, There are three main channels for Microsoft 365 apps for enterprise. One is the current channel. That's where this is currently rolling out. Current channel is the channel that receives updates essentially as soon as they're ready. So when a new feature is ready to roll out, you get it right away. Monthly channel receives receives an update on a monthly basis, as the name would imply. That includes all of that month's recent additions to the Office apps. And then there's a semi-annual channel, which receives those updates twice a year. So a lot of enterprises probably are not running current channel for all your users anyway. You're probably on monthly or semi-annual. And as Andy said, this only affects the defaults. If you have configured a stricter setting, that will, of course, continue to be respected. So great news all around. I know... There were a lot of security professionals that were concerned, again, maybe not so much for their own orgs, but just in in the sense that a rising tide lifts all ships in a security sense. And um, I was even pleased, too, to see that this came back so quickly. It is a good, positive change, and it looks like that feedback was taken into account really, really quickly, which I kind of speculated is is what was holding it up, and I wound up being right. Um, And so just great news all around. So we can move on. Yeah, and tonight we wanted to talk about email security and do a deep dive on Exchange Online Protection. Yes, the often misunderstood Exchange Online Protection, or EOP. And if any of you have been around the block long enough, you may remember its predecessor, Forefront Online Protection for Exchange, or FOPI, (laughs) as it was often known. And I actually lived through a FOPI to EOP migration um, back in the day, like 10 years ago now, I'm totally dating myself. So exchange online protection, what is it and why are we talking about it? Well, number one, we assume the majority of our listeners work in an enterprise setting and we know by virtue of market share that the majority of enterprises do use exchange or exchange online for their email environment. Not all. We do understand there are folks on Um, Google Workspace and and any other competitors that exist out there. But for the most part, majority of this probably is applicable. And if you have an Exchange Online environment, then you have Exchange Online protection. For anyone that has mailboxes hosted in Exchange Online, you get this automatically. And so, well, what is it? Well, if you think of whenever we're doing any sort of filtering against malware and other threats, we want to do that in, in the sense of you think of like a funnel, you start with the widest part of the funnel and you start whittling that down as rapidly as possible. Start getting rid of 
the, the very low value kind of things. And so an email that's like low value messages, obvious spam, obvious junk, obvious malicious files, uh, and get rid of them right away. That's what Exchange Online Protection event essentially does. So it is that first pass, that first cut of eliminating stuff flowing into your environment. And it's going to be based on Microsoft's vast threat intelligence and, and is fed and updated constantly with think of like signature based or kinds of detection, those sorts of things, rule-based detections. That's what EOP really is. Um, and so as let's say a, a new threat makes its way into the wild and it is a zero day and it's not going to mass a signature, then yes, it may pass through exchange online protection and it may move into something we'll talk about a little later, uh, Microsoft Defender for Office 365, which can actually do that kind of detonation of attachments. And it may determine that zero day is malicious and it will block it there and take that signature and pass it back to Exchange Online Protection. So now moving forward, it's a much simpler you know, and less computationally expensive block. But continuing that further down the kill chain, that malicious attachment maybe passes through Defender for Office 365 because the malware author is clever and detected it was running in the sandbox. And so it made its way to an endpoint. And so now Microsoft Defender for Endpoint, Microsoft's antivirus and endpoint protection platform and EDR platform may catch that zero day and determine it's malicious when it actually detonates its payload on a real endpoint. And again, it's going to capture that signature, flow it back to Exchange Online Protection, and begin blocking it at the source. So th the real takeaway here to know is that if you are an Exchange Online customer, Exchange Online Protection is always getting better and is always being infused with all of that threat intelligence from Microsoft's other solutions, even if you as a customer don't use those solutions. That's really kind of the key point here is you get the benefit of the Microsoft ecosystem to protect your email and, and get that protection. And this applies regardless of if you're using Microsoft for your protection or if maybe you're using a Proofpoint or a Mimecast or a Cisco. Even after your messages pass through Proofpoint or Mimecast or whatever, they still pass through Exchange Online protection. So again, this, this is literally protection for everyone that hosts mail and exchange online, and it's often misunderstood. What are the benefits of it? What is built in? What is Microsoft doing to help protect your email? And so that's why we wanted to touch on this today. We thought a great opportunity to educate on something that is widely used by hundreds of thousands, if not millions of organizations, and your organization probably uses it too, and you may not know enough about it. So let's do some education, let's learn, and, uh, grow our knowledge. Another thing that I've seen organizations do who may not be on Microsoft's stack, like using Proofpoint or Mimecast, I've seen them disable EOP, which you can do by turning off the spam and phishing protections within your Office admin portal. Oftentimes, I think, why would you do that? Because it's just another layer of protection. And so we're going to talk about a lot of the pre-delivery protections that EOP gives you, as well as some post-delivery protection. And again, this is for all M365 customers who are using Exchange Online as their email. So first off, when a message gets sent and it hits the outer layer, we'll call it the edge, edge protection. It will then just pass through a connection filter. And that's very basic. It just checks the sender's reputation by IP or domain. And you can configure allow, block, or safe lists within your admin portal to allow things that may be suspicious to the threat intelligence of that edge. It uses all of the telemetry that Microsoft gets from all of our customers, including Outlook.com, which is our consumer base email and it checks that and like adam said it's more of a static signature base is this domain or ip 
on the suspicious list based on our threat intelligence. And if it is, it gets blocked. And the majority of spam is stopped at this point right now and rejected by EOP. If it passes through the connection filter, it then gets inspected from malware. Again, using very static detections like hashes. And if a malware is found either within the message itself or as an attachment, it will be delivered to quarantine. By default, only admins have access to malware quarantine messages. However, if you choose, you can allow your users to take action and configure it that way. If a message passes through the malware check and there's you know, nothing in the connection filter, nothing in the malware filter, and then goes through policy filtering and it gets evaluated against mail flow or transport rules that you have identified. And these could be something like you want to append an external sender banner on that message because it's coming from outside the organization or you want an alert because a certain domain has sent an email or you may want to route mail from a specific address to another inbox. Those are all mail flow rules. It gets analyzed for policy and it goes through that. On a side note, I had actually sent an email to a customer who was interested in the external sender banner. And traditionally, this has been done through Mailflow rules. There's an HTML block that you can configure and it'll put whatever you want in there and it'll pen that message. I learned in doing some research on this episode that there's actually PowerShell commandlet that was added in March of 2021 that can add, add a tag It's different than the mail flow rules and it's a little bit different than the banner that's appended, but it's the same concept. And it's basically a feature that Microsoft added to Exchange Online because so many customers have wanted this. And so there's a PowerShell commandlet that you can use, get get dash external in Outlook, which will then show you all the tags uh, for that. And then you can set dash external in Outlook and basically set it to true. If you set it to true, every single external email will get a tag on it, including if you're using Outlook Mobile on both Android and iOS, it'll show external on that. So really cool, very easy to do. Um, You just need to run it in Exchange Online PowerShell. Couple of notes before you move on there, Andy, on mail flow rules, um, transport rules, whatever you wanna call them today. Number one, the last thing you talked about first, that external tag, this is awesome and you should turn this on because, and and let me tell you where it came from. So early on in the pandemic, Microsoft IT started doing what we've seen a lot of customers do, which is in the subject line, put like bracket external close bracket at the beginning of the subject line and appending that to every email. Well, anyone who's had emails go back and forth between your org and another org the message starts looking like external, 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 and it it obfuscates what the subject line is, and it just looks gross. Um, and and so <laughs> they turned this on internally at Microsoft. People screamed bloody murder, and I think they turned it back off. If not, they did create an opt out, which I remember I went and did like right away. You could join a group to opt out of it. Um, this does it in a clean way. That's part of the UI. That's appropriate for whatever client you're using. So. It, it essentially sets metadata on the message to say, show the external thing in the UI. And then whatever client you're using, like Andy said, Outlook Mobile on iOS, it's going to display it a little differently than the Win32 Outlook app, which is different than the Mac OS Outlook app, which is different than Outlook on the web. But they all do it in a way that makes sense and looks good. And it's very clear that it's an external message without making it like super ugly and gross and a bad user experience. So you should totally go turn this on, uh, dear listener, or tell your exchange people to do it because it's awesome. It's really, really good. The other part of mail flow rules I wanted to touch on is this is something and this is going to sound like a captain obvious thing, but this is, this is from real world experience. Okay. A lot of times customers have told us at Microsoft, like we don't want to use your mail filtering technology 
again, we're talking about EOP, which is the built-in stuff everyone has. But then we have a, a paid offering, Defender for Office 365, which we'll talk about more in a little bit. And we'd rather go use Proofpoint or Mimecast or Cisco or whomever because they're better than you. Uh, we get better results when we tested you head to head. Well, what we found out actually happens a lot of time is customers will set very liberal mail flow rules that cast a very wide net and can apply to a lot of messages and allow those to completely bypass all filtering and spam confidence level to negative one and all that sort of stuff. And so essentially what customers were doing is through well-intentioned mail flow rules to let some sort of vendors messages come through or to let some employee survey through or whatever, they were creating a massive set of exemptions for mail to pass through our filtering untouched. We were doing exactly what the customer told us to do, but it was an example where what the customer wanted and what they tried to implement didn't really match up. And, and so instead when they'd go stand up like a proof point instance, which had a whole set separate set of filtering, they wouldn't go carry all that over. And then it would appear to do better because they weren't carving out all these exemptions for it. Long winded story short, and this comes from real world experience. You need to be extremely conservative with your mail flow rules and you need to have process in place to revisit them and make sure you still need them because this is a really powerful thing where you're essentially telling Microsoft, yeah, we know you've got all this great threat intelligence and filtering. We don't want it. Let it through. Ignore all that. And that's not a great security posture to adopt. So when you are carving these holes in your mail filtering, you want them to be as surgical and as precise as possible. And I'm just saying from real world experience, we have found that customers oftentimes are shooting big, big holes um, in their email protection. So Mail flow rules <laughs> are very literal and do what they say they will do. And so make sure that how they're configured matches up with what your expectations are. Very good call out, Adam. Definitely do a review of your mail flow rules because those will apply regardless of what solution that you have. Mm -hmm. So if it passes through the policy filtering and there's no issues there, the message will then go through a content filtering. And again, this is run by Microsoft's intelligent threat feed, and there's not a whole lot EOP customers can really change about this particular content filtering. It does anti-spam, anti-spoofing. And if the messages are identified as spam, high confidence spam, phishing, um, bulk or spoofing, it will then also get quarantined or blocked. If it passes through all of that, then it finally gets delivered to the recipients. And so you can see there's actually quite a bit of pre-delivery protection for all EOP customers, which is anyone who's using Exchange Online. Now, there is a bit of post-delivery protection, and it's something called ZAP or Zero Hour Auto Purge. What Zap is, and both Adam and I learned that Zap actually applies to EOP, which we didn't know before because it is a feature that we talk about. We often talk about it with our enterprise customers who are Defender for Office 365 customers. Zap is a post-delivery protection where it retroactively detects and neutralizes malicious phishing, spam, malware messages that have already been delivered to exchange online mailboxes. And so, you know, in a dynamic world where spam and malware signatures are getting updated all the time, the service is getting updated on the back end. So as we detect different signatures from different customers or outlook.com as our consumers, you know, those signatures and detection um, algorithms get updated. And when they do, if for some reason something has gotten through that has been updated as malicious, Zap is going to go back and remove that email. For users, Zap is completely seamless. They aren't notified that the message was detected or moved. And it goes again to quarantine by default for the admins to see and take action on if they need to. 
again, that can be configured to change if you want users to take action on their own quarantine. It's very important that your safe sender lists and your mail flow rules, your inbox rules, and any other additional filters will take precedent over Zap. So if there's like what Adam is talking about, if you have configured something to make it safe from this domain, from this user, for this wide net of emails that you're going to get, and you've punched a hole in your email security, it will take precedent over Zap. So again, that's very important to understand. Zap is good stuff. Um, and it's interesting too. I, I think Andy, um, some of the documentation we're linking to talks about, you know, a lot of times attackers won't weaponize their content right away. They'll send a malicious URL and you click on it, and you get a cat video. But then a day or two later, after that message has been delivered, now that URL takes you to a, a phishing site that attempts to harvest credentials. And essentially what we're saying here is if that message gets initially delivered to users' mailboxes and then it later becomes weaponized and we recognize that in our service, in our threat intelligence, we can go back and start removing it from people's mailboxes automatically without even notifying a user, without there being any user response required. That's awesome, being able to dip in post delivery and take care of that, um, and and that's a benefit that um, sometimes is much more challenging to do with some of these uh, pre delivery security solutions as well. So, and it's again, it's baked in. Like, there's nothing to buy. You just get that automatically if you're an exchange online. So, really cool stuff there too. So, we also announced a few months, maybe a year ago now. We broke up what used to be Office ATP into two different plans, Microsoft Defender for Office 365 Plan 1 and Plan 2. So Plan 1 is included with all M365 business premium customers, and it can be purchased a la carte or standalone. Mm -hmm. But what that gives you is everything we've talked about so far with Exchange Online Protection Plus some of the premium advanced security gateway features that a lot of customers honestly need these days. It's kind of table stakes at this point, whether it's through Microsoft or through someone else, but that gives you the safe attachments, the detonation, the URL safe links and detonation of those safe attachments for SharePoint, OneDrive and Teams, which is something I think a lot of the competitors out there don't have. So it's mm -hmm. additional protection on top of that not just email. And then of course, for enterprise customers, you got SIM integration, APIs, alerts in M365, Defender, um, and that you know URL rewrite if you want, or the API protection when you click on the back end. And so those are all like base features in the MDO P1. And if you go to MDO P2, which is included with M365 E5 customers, that adds on like threat intelligence. So it has like a threat tracker, campaigns, advanced hunting or proactive hunting. It has the attack simulation, which is your internal phishing program. And then most importantly, automated investigations. I just want to touch real quick on automated investigations and response, which we call air. Those can be triggered on things that it's actually a really long list, but some things are like, for example, if a user reports a message as malicious or if a message was zapped, as we were talking about, or there's just some sort of patterns that it recognizes as malicious, an error will kick off and it gathers data about that email in question and all entities related to that email. Entities can include files, URLs, and recipients, and then as new data is gathered or if more alerts are triggered, that specific error can increase in scope. It's really cool because if an email is malicious or something like that, it can then scan all of your emails or any recipient's emails. It just kind of does it for you without you having to take any action. By default, there's no remediation actions that are automatically taken specifically for Defender for Office 365. But you will get a list of actions 
as an admin to go in there and take a look at, and you can approve them or reject them. An example would be like, we found that this email was malicious. We can then remove it from all of your inboxes that it's been delivered. Check yes if you want to do that. No, if you want to do it manually yourself. And so that's an example of something that I think a lot of customers ask for. So that's a quick overview. We don't want to get too deep because, you know, obviously Adam and I both work for Microsoft, but we don't want to, this to be all about that. We really wanted to do a deep dive on exchange online protection to give you an understanding of the protections that almost everybody has who's using exchange online. Absolutely. And it's, it's worth just adding on, you know, as an awareness, that way you can create that separation in your mind of like what's included for everyone. And then what's a paid add on that adds that additional capability for zero day protection, right? So everyone gets those kind of rule based signature based hash based protections in EOP. It's that that top of the filter that starts to really whittle down from, you know, millions and billions of malicious messages down to a manageable amount um, that still might get through because there's zero day. And that's where you you may want additional protection, which Microsoft does offer and is also a very competitive space um, as well. So certainly Microsoft does do that. If you're interested, you know, you could talk to your account team and and look into that appropriately. And and I will just say, too, um, from an IT analyst perspective, you know, it scores very well. Um, Forrester has Microsoft in the upper right of their wave. So they are good solutions. I think where um, sometimes folks have chosen to go third party in the past has been around, like I said, some of those efficacy type questions. And, and a lot of times we found those were actually due to um, well-intentioned, but essentially misconfigured mail flow rules. So um, yeah, good, good stuff here. And, and again, a lot, a lot that's built in. So no reason to turn this off because it's definitely additional layer of protection. Even if you're going third party for your zero day protection, um, EOP is still just an extra set of eyes on it. And that's definitely not going to hurt. So, you know, good stuff there. Yeah. And there are a lot of really good products out there. Mm-hmm. Like Very competitive points like Mimecast. And honestly, like if you have one of those and that's what you've implemented, certainly, you know, and it's working well for you, keep it. If that, if you're happy with the protection that you're getting, um, proof point and Mimecast, which are two very, you know, popular uh, options um, are both MX record base. And so if you're using Exchange Online, your MX record starts with Microsoft. It, it lives with Microsoft and it's pointed to Microsoft. But if you have to use one of these other ones, you have to change your MX record, which can be a burden to deploy. It's also a burden to change if you're moving off of one of those. And so... There are other solutions out there like Avion by Checkpoint. It's API based. And if you're using an API based and there's other ones out there, Checkpoint is just one of them that offers it. But if you're using an API based solution, those are a little bit easier to implement because they don't require you to change your MX record in your DNS. Obviously, if you're using Microsoft solution like Defender for Office, you're not going to need to change your MX record because it's already pointing to Microsoft and it's seamless to turn on. So deployment is an issue with email because it is a critical part of business. So if you are getting or evaluating these solutions and you haven't gotten on board yet with an advanced security, advanced email security gateway, you probably want to look at getting something out there as quick as possible and without much downtime for your users so you know there's different options so just keep that in mind Mm -hmm. absolutely yeah just second that if you don't have a zero day advanced threat protection solution you need one um andy you know we've mentioned some microsoft solutions some third-party solutions just get one (laughs) and get going um and and that's a really interesting point that avanon by checkpoint i i hadn't heard of that before I actually had not even heard of API based email protection, although that makes sense. Um, certainly you can query the uh, Office 365 activity API or, or M365 graph APIs to pull email and then scan them. That would be a way to do it. That's interesting. Um, and what I like about that approach too, because that's going to be whether you're using like Avanon or whether you're using Defender for Office 365, 
is you're allowing EOP to do its job as that first cut because it is somewhat backwards. And and I'm not saying you shouldn't do this, but if you send your messages to one of those third party solutions first, because you're using MX record based, you know, redirection, essentially you're, you're having it go through an advanced threat protection solution. Assumably they also have like signature based first just to save their compute resources. Um, but then you're running it through that kind of signature hash based rule based detection again, um, which is the wrong order. Cause again, you want to go from that funnel. You want to, do the biggest impact first with the littlest compute. And then what's left, that's when you start doing that detonation and those more um, rigorous inspection. So that model just makes more sense to me anyway. Um, and so I like that a lot. That's, that's intriguing. So, you know, hopefully our listeners learned something. I know I did about zero hour auto purge. And, you know, we learned about that everyone on exchange online gets EOP and about, an API based secure email gateway. I learned stuff tonight. Hopefully your listeners did too. And that's our show for this week. Thanks for listening and watching our contact information will be in the show notes. If you have any questions or topics you want us to talk about, thanks. We'll talk to you guys next week. Thank you for listening to the blue security podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed and subscribe. So you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at a jaw zero and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.